Clifton Roberts, who is a, a politician. This is going to be our first vegan senator. Is that right? <laughs> He yes. was our first uh, vegan presidential candidate, uh, and we're, I'm just so thrilled to have somebody that, when we go to the polls, that somebody that we can we believe, believe in somebody. And, you know, it seems like we're always stuck with two candidates that we're not always totally thrilled about, that doesn't always have our best interest in mind, and I have a feeling he does. So, without further ado, Mr. Clifton Rowe. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. Uh, I am in love with San Francisco. Just to give you a little bit of background about myself, I actually attended the University of California at Berkeley. And uh, I was back um, maybe five years ago. I'm joking. Uh, it was 1991, and I actually, uh, my first internship was with the Lehman Brothers as a junior. And that's when I, at one point, made a decision that I wanted to be a stockholder because when I was on the floor interning, all they would yell out over the microphone is, Mike made $10,000 this week. And, you know, as a young, 20-year-old uh, young man, of course, that appealed to me. And uh, so I just love San Francisco, and thank you for spending this 45 minutes with me. So only if I was thinking about what I wanted to talk to you about, and I'm sure that, you know, myself as a vegan of 20 years, I'm sure that in your own journey as vegetarians and vegans and environmentalists, you have come across a lot of information about your health, about the environment. So I wanted to, to talk about something that maybe you don't know about, and that surpri will surprise you as much as it surprised me when I learned about it. So the title of my talk today is Only If. And you'll see why I say that. <clears throat> so by show of hands, how many people in this room can look at this, these three letters and tell me what it is an acronym for? Now don't yell it out, just by show of hands, how many people know what ICD is an effort for. Okay, I thought that that might be the case. And as a matter of fact, <laughs> this is incredible to me because to every single one of you in this room today, these three letters are almost everything. Can I give you a hint? Okay, so a little bit more color, right? You see those three letters again. Does this help? How many people have any idea <laughs> what this is? Okay, we have some ideas. What do you think? Say again? Disease. Okay. And someone back here, you're, you're saying it has to do with the heart. Okay. I'm, I'm so impressed. But, but you, you'll, you'll see where I'm going with this in just a second, okay? These, especially, oops, let me, let me go back. Especially the, uh, so, uh, especially this one here, this is very important because everybody is exposed to this in some way, somehow, some shape, some form, has actually experienced directly the effects of these three letters. So specifically, I'm going to go ahead and give this up. ICD is an acronym for International Coding of Diseases. And now it's on version 10, but when I was exposed to it, it was version 9. And I'll, tell you, I'll, I'll share a little story with you about when and where and how I was exposed to it. Now, the C61 part, ICD-10, C61, actually means malignant neoplasm. Now, if you're like me, you're probably thinking the same thing I thought. When I first, I, I knew what this, I had an idea of the malignant, right? Bad, right? But when I saw that, the first thing I thought of was Ghostbusters. <laughs> Remember the plasma dude? Yeah. <laughs> so that's the first thing I thought of. But that's what it means. Now I'm going to talk about what this means in just a second, okay? Because it's going to blow your minds. 
like it did me. All right. So why am I talking about this today? Why am I a former presidential candidate, a vegan, a guy who works at Intel Corporation? And by the way, my job at Intel for, uh, is senior manager of ethics and legal compliance. So I'm not a, an engineer, but I make sure that every all 100,000 employees at our company that's worldwide does their job with uncompromising integrity, following the letter and the spirit of the law and the rules and regulations of internationally and nationally. That's my job. It's a, and I try to make it fun. So it's a fun job. But anyway, why am I talking about this? Well, I kind of hinted earlier that I'm talking about this because most of us don't know. Like you saw, I put up three letters, and none of you knew really what it meant. But when I look at it, it's now the first thing I think of is how important it is to our health. So, it's important to me specifically because it's very, very personal to me. All right? It's very personal to me because of these two awesome individuals holding this cute little baby. I have no idea who he is. Um, yeah, that's me. That's, that's my daddy. And that's my mom. So, specifically, it's important to me, and I was exposed to it to those three letters because of this guy, this handsome guy right here. Now, to give you a little bit of a background, my father was raised in the Maryland, D.C. area. He had a dream after watching some movie about military guys going to overseas to meet Susie Wong. He wanted to join the military and meet his Susie Wong. So uh, he joined the Air Force. He traveled to, uh, he got stationed in Korea. And my mother was, was at that time very, very young. It's almost like an Elvis Priscilla Presley type story. Um, but they didn't care. And uh, she lived on a little tiny island in, in, off the tip of South Korea called Cheju Island. And Cheju is very, uh, very famous for women diving for oysters and pearls without any scuba equipment and diving really deep. And my, my, so I have heritage in that. So they met and fell in love, and that was, that was even an interesting story because they didn't speak each other's language, but they obviously spoke the language of love, and then he talked her parents into letting her marry him. So anyway, my father, so that's him there with my grandfather. Uh, I lost both of these amazing human beings very early. Both of them passed away in their early 60s. Um, but to be more specific, my father, around, I want to say 2001, uh, actually a little bit earlier than, you know, it was around 2001, he finally came to me and said that he wasn't feeling right. He shared with me that he didn't want to talk to me about it, but he was very scared, and my father was a very macho type guy. The type of guy that when I first said I'm tired, he said, don't ever let me hear you say that word again. You're a 17-year-old young man. Your father, your grandfather worked three jobs. I don't ever want you, I don't want to hear you say that again. Like, that's the type of guy he was. But he came to me and said, Clifton, I'm feeling weird. I don't feel right. Something is going on inside of me. I just can't explain it, but you know, something is... When you know something's wrong, you just know your body, right? And, and so that's what he was sharing with me. And the, the key word there was unexplainable. Like he kept using that word. I can't explain it. It's just unexplainable. But it hurts. It's uncomfortable. There's discomfort. There's dis-ease. There is you know, dis, disarray. Uh, he, he just did not feel right. And, and, but I did know the only thing he could uh, explained very well was that it was in this area that he just didn't feel good. <clears throat> so, like any of us would do, he goes to visit his primary care physician. Now, remember, my father is retired military. So at this time, I think he goes to the VA, the Veterans Administration, it's a vet the Veterans Hospital, and he goes to his primary care physician and he basically tells his primary care physician everything that's going on. Same things that he tells me. And his primary care physician basically says, you know, I'm going to need some more help on this. I'm, 
I'm going to need to bring in a specialist. I mean, I'm familiar with these symptoms, but I don't want to tell you what I think it might be. And I'm going to bring in an expert. So he talks to uh, someone, uh, a human being, that had happened to study a lot, a lot, a lot. And, uh, and it's called an oncologist, right? And his oncologist, after doing some uh, CT scans, some x-rays, uh, MRI, uh, biopsies, a lot of money. Now granted, my father has health insurance, but still his insurance carrier, you guys are all familiar with this, right? This insurance person, a carrier, has had to pay maybe for MRIs and CAT scans and office visits, all of that. I mean, this was probably in the $10,000 to $20,000 range, right? Just for testing, biopsies. And <laughs> On top of that, the first couple of times, they didn't find anything, but he kept feeling unusual, so he kept returning until finally a biopsy showed that he had something. So it was then that his doctor finally diagnosed my father with ICD-9. At that time, ICD-9, this was ICD-9 code 159, but now it's uh, C61, malignant neoplasm. Now, let me tell you the irony of what happened, and this is why I became interested in, in furthering the, the cause of veganism, furthering the cause of um, the right way to eat into politics. The irony here is my father goes to his doctors and says, hey doc, Something's going on, I can't explain it. I'm hurting. The doctor diagnoses him and says, you know what? You are absolutely right. Malignant neoplasm means unexplainable growth in the living tissue. When I learned that, now let me tell you how I learned that. At the time, I was working at a place called HealthNet Federal Services. This is before Intel. I was recruited there from Nations Bank. I was a branch manager of Nations Bank. I managed an $18 million branch. It was consumer services. And uh, my claim to fame there was that I trained other branch managers very well. So I was recruited by HealthNet Federal Services, which is a subsidiary of HealthNet Inc. And HealthNet was the uh, eastern region Healthcare administrator for Tricare. Now, how many people in this room know what Tricare is? What back there? What's Tricare? Um, well, that was that was insurance we used in the military. Military, exactly. So they they split up the United States into regions, and Tricare is the healthcare that that the military folks receive. So my job as senior manager of training and development was to train the customer service representatives, the enrollment representatives, the claims adjudicators, and the medical management personnel, which basically were nurses, that would figure out if, when a, when a private in the Air Force would call in if he needed a referral, my job was to train them to make sure that the, the military was receiving the best in class care possible. That was my job. So when my father told me about this C61, which is at that time C159, uh, I looked it up. And I looked up malignant neoplasm, and I couldn't believe my eyes when it said, and so I asked him, I said, wait, Daddy, Daddy, I still call him Daddy. Daddy, let me make sure I get this right. You went to your doctor, you said you can't explain this, and he said, you're right, I can't explain it, but pay $10,000. <laughs> He said, well, yeah, actually, that's, that's the way it went. So ultimately, um, I lost him in 2006. And um, he made me promise that at his funeral that it would be a party. So literally, I was the only one not crying. And probably people that loved me and loved him were wondering why I wasn't crying. But it was because I made a promise to him. And we did have a good time at his funeral. Uh, he's buried, actually, in Dixon at the Veterans Memorial uh, Cemetery. Again, the irony of a medical practitioner, and in their mind, and 
in their hearts, they're doing the best job that they can, of a patient going to them and saying, I can't explain what's going on to me. On with me. And then the doctor coming back and telling them, yep, you're right, you have an unexplainable growth in the living tissue. And here are my set of procedures. Now there's a predefined set of procedures for this type of, for a specific ICD-10, ICD I've got to get that used to saying that, uh, ICD-10 code. So if it's, you know, if you break your arm, there is a predefined set of procedures. And that's actually how insurance companies bill you. Uh, or doctors bill insurance companies and you, I'm sorry. Um, is they send the code, then they tell the insurance company, these are the set of procedures that we're going to perform. And then that's when the insurance company says, okay, that's approved, or no, that doesn't match. Um, but again, I, I, I love talking about this story, and I said, wow, what a, what a great opportunity to talk about this in front of you folks here who are here talking about you know, veganism and sustainable living and plant-based diets. So I titled this Only If because only if my father had discovered, discovered veganism as I did when I was 30, and I just turned 50. Uh, on Sunday. Um, yeah, I went vegan uh, at the age of 30. Only if my father had been vegan. Only if he had not over his life uh, consumed meat. And my acronym for me, it is muscle and epinephrine of animal tissue. That's my acronym. Because, you know, animals get killed, they get scared, just like all of us. We're faced with death. Our muscles are pumped with epinephrine, right? Well, there's no washing that out of an animal. So that's my, my acronym. Just what, what was the acronym? <laughs> muscle and epinephrine of animal tissue. Yeah. Epinephrine is a form of adrenaline. <laughs> so if I just run up to him with a knife, <laughs> You know, he's going to freak out, and he has to make a decision if he's going to fight me back or if he's going to run. You guys have all heard that old, you know, it's common knowledge, right? Fight or flight. Um, only if my father was vegan. Only if he was here today, he would, he would have never imagined in a million years that not only would his son have a, a family and a, a newborn at the age of 50, But run for president <laughs> or run for U.S. Senate. Like he used to tell me, Clifton, you're not worth two cents. <laughs> he used to say that to me all the time. Only if my father was around or my grandfather to see his great grandchildren. And I truly believe 100% with every ounce of me, with every piece of logic that I have in my mind, with every belief that I have in my heart. That plant-based consumption is not only the best for you, but it's the best for this planet. And I am by far no medical doctor, but remember, medical doctors are called medical practitioners. And they're not called that for any reason, because obviously if these guys can't even figure out what's going on with cancer. There's a rapper that my, father, my son introduced me to. Um, I found out he just went vegan. His name is Waka Flocka. <laughs> My son is 22 years old, but you know, he keeps me up, right? And uh, his name is Waka Flocka. And I, so I was curious. I said, really? This, and my son is vegan. My son is 22. He's an actor down in, in L.A. And uh, my daughter, 12-year-old, is also vegan. My wife, is, my wife is vegan. We're all vegan. And so I said, well, let me see this Waka Flocka. I just like saying it. <laughs> so I said, let me see Waka Flocka. And I listened to his music, and it was a little too hardcore for me. But I've seen his videos. I've seen him sit down with Russell Simmons. I'm sure all you all have heard of Russell Simmons. And Maya, who's another artist, that R&B artist that's vegan. And he, had, he was so funny. He said, how long has cancer and diabetes been popping? 
You know, it was just funny that he's put it that way. He's like, how long has it been around? How long have they been doing research on this? So I say this because only if not only doctors were trained, classically trained, the way that attorneys are classically trained to ask strategic questions, only if doctors, all of our doctors were trained in nutrition, trained, uh, soaked and drenched in truth, only in it, right? I'm going to be running for Senate in 2018. And as a matter of fact, there's a certain somebody in the audience who's the member of a member of uh, the board of directors uh, for a polit the political party that I represent, which is the Humane Party. <laughs> um, Stacy, she's one of the board members, and she's helped me file uh, papers with the Federal Election Committee. So I'm officially a candidate. I'm going to be announcing soon, um, but. I am going to really go to bat for telling the truth when we make it into Congress. When I, as your voice, and the voice of animals, and the voice of our, our land, air, and water resources, and the voice of our planet, when I go in there, I am going to be the one that's going to start telling the truth. And it's what we did for our U.S. Uh, presidential run in 2016. Myself and the uh, vice presidential running mate, my name is Breeze Harper. We told the truth. There was no skating around it. We weren't, you know, the Green Party, bless their hearts, but no one in the Green Party has to take an oath to live their lives according to humane values, and that's what every single candidate has to do. Um, so I'm not going to only talk about access to care. I'm not only going to talk about premiums or who is covered or are existing conditions covered. I mean, when you think about it that way, that's a morbid way to talk. Our existing conditions covered. Like, who are these people insuring? It's, it's, we should be talking about proactive ways to do it, talking about the truth, reversing disease and sickness. Um, or who is covered? You know, my son, in, in the recent debate, my, my son, I mean, this was actually a good thing for him, but I can cover him on my insurance until he's 26. Um, and then all the same insurance carriers, right? So. My platform that is aligned very much strategically to the Humane Party platform is going to be addressing health, among other things. And I am not pulling out any punches when it comes to going to the Hill and talking about truth, right? Using logic and common sense and not letting long medical jargon and words that are 50 characters in length and, uh, 50 characters in length, top, um, excuse me guys, 50 characters in length, they got confused me, all right? So only if there was additional competition in healthcare. Now remember, when I worked in healthcare, health net federal services, that infrastructure is the only infrastructure that is competing right now. So if you picture Usain Bolt running a race, and he's always out here in the front. He crosses the finish line early, right? And the rest of the pack is right back here. Our current healthcare system is that infrastructure. Insurance, you're right here in the middle. Insurance, ICD-9 coding, CPT coding, then we pay the, um, we pay your medical practitioners, right? There's no other, there's no competition to this. This is it, and we've all accepted it. And you know how, how I know we've all accepted it? Because the majority of the people in this room have had no idea what even ICD meant. I mean, if you go to the doctor and your doctor turns your illness and your sickness into a number and then sends that number to your insurance company and then recommends to your insurance company that they're going to perform a set of procedures. For my dad, it was either radiate it, remove it, right? Or treat it with some pills. That's a, those are numbers too, by the way. Those are numbers for efficiency and for scale. That's how insurance companies that, that, uh, accommodate this. So that's how I know that there's no competition. The military version of healthcare was the very best version there is, right? But every single Kaiser, Sutter Health, 
the many healthcare systems that are across this country that I've never even heard of, they all follow this model. You come in, you're sick, you have an office visit, you, you're charged that. International coding of disease. What's the code? What is the, the, the corresponding set of CPT codes, which is current procedural terminology? And the insurance company pays the doctors. Okay? We want to introduce competition to this infrastructure. And right now, we have a policy team, we have an economic transition team, all volunteers that are working, I'm working with, and the board of directors are working with, and we're working with folks like you, getting your input. And we're seeing technology change a lot of things. There's crowdfunding. I mean, I'm just off the top of the head, just being creative. What about crowdfunding care? Where we follow, you know, if someone had cancer and they, and they uh, went vegan and the cancer went away, let's use that as a case study. Let's use that as a case study. Then let's all get together and say, hey, so-and-so has cancer, but he's decided to go vegan. He's trying these options. Let's, let's get together and help each other. I mean, there's a number of ways that we can think creatively and collectively to, to do this stuff. So definitely competition with this system. Only if there was, and our hope with the Humane Party is that we will in, inject competition into this a uh, lopsided marketplace of health insurance. Okay. Only if, only if our politicians told the truth. And a lot of them don't even know that they're not telling the truth. A lot of them are still drowning in custom and heritage tradition, and habit, and selfishness, to even realize, when, even when they're presented with facts, that they still think, I mean, you, you hear it now, people think that climate change is a hoax. Uh, you know, there's, I, I was reading, have, have, have any of you ever just gone to the Center for Disease Control, the website you have? I love going there just to kind of learn. You know, I, I like it. it is like a library, isn't it? Yeah, I, I literally, and so I went there recently. And I wanted to, in preparation for this talk, I wanted to figure out what the common uh, diseases were that led to death. And you have, in, in California, it's, it's heart disease uh, was, was one, and cancer was another one. Um, homicide, actually, was some, but. And they actually met, they actually mentioned prolonged consumption of animals. But they they hide it in the in the rhetoric of everything else that they're they're publishing. They literally say prolonged consumption of animals. You know, I, I might have one word off, but literally I was surprised Is to that see that. Page fifty or yeah, it might be 50 or 60, or I'm not sure, I don't know. But man, it, it, it is there. I, I went there and I looked at it and I was like, wow, why are we talking about that more? Why, why are we talking about this? Well, I intend, as, yeah, that's right, money, right? I mean, there's some, there's some tremendously powerful spe special interests. Let me tell you, so powerful that when I ran for president uh, in 2016, uh, one of the founders of the party, his name is Shell Harrison, a brilliant, brilliant man, he wrote me one day and he said, you know, we had just published a rendition of the Abolition Amendment, which is a proposed constitutional amendment abolishing the torture, mutilation, slaughter of all non-human animals. Right? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yes. We proposed that. Um, and immediately after that, Shell, for the first time, I've never heard a worry in his voice. He said, Clifton, I'm worried. You know, watch where you're walking to, watch your surroundings. And sure enough, I started to get emails threatening my life, wishing that I would, I would die. It was the first time ever um, I had ever experienced anything like that, personally, where someone actually wrote me. And it's something I've never shared with people because I wanted it to be a positive campaign. And ours was the campaign, I'm very proud of it. We, we probably got around 300,000 votes nationwide, which for the first time out, I've never been a politician. Um, 
But it, it, it's amazing that when you focus on truth, we talked about money, that this, these are the things that are going to happen, but we need to talk about it. And in my presidential acceptance speech, I, I said that this is a platform that we all should live by. This is a platform that I would truly die for, because I have children. And one thing that people, especially non-vegans and non-vegetarians and non-environmentalists, is that they tend to look right here at the beginning of their feet when they were going through life. Where I would like to look beyond, 200 years from now, I'm still going to have children, but they're going to be my great, great, great grandchildren. But they're going to be of me. And I want this world to be wonderful for them. Um, so only if we started to tell the truth about animal agriculture and, and its effect on climate change, its effect on disease, its effect on world hunger. Even hunger here, I was coming in through San Francisco and it's not too different than Sacramento where I, where I drove from. A lot of homeless people right there on the street asking for money. Um, you know, only if we told the truth about the resource depletion, the depletion of our air, land, and water resources against further contamination. Only if. Well, you know, I am so proud to be able to tell you that I came across this political party in 2014, working at Intel. Uh, one of my friends, I found out, was very sick went to high school with him, and then he died. I mean, I heard he was sick, then he passed away. He's my age. We played football together. And so, you know, I said, you know, I am going to either donate to a political party or volunteer for a political party that tells the truth. I had been vegan at that time for like 17 years. I said, I'm going to finally find a political party that is not the Democrats and not the Republicans and not the Greens and not the Libs and just tell the truth. And if I don't find it, I'm going to start my own. Sure enough, I did a Google search and this party, the Humane Party, came up. I was shocked. I, I kept looking at it. And, and, and not only that, but they were looking for CEOs to run the party. I didn't think, now I had never been a CEO of anything. I, I, I was working at Intel, and I was, I'm considered a tech exec, right? But still, you know, a CEO for Intel, is, that's huge. Um, so I, I volunteered. I submitted a volunteer application. And the, I remember them saying that there was um, some sort of pay for the CEO at that time. And when I got the call to, and, and the offer to be the Humane Party CEO, one of the first things I did was I eliminated the pay for, for CEO. I wanted the CEOs to be all volunteers. So, and I wanted to be the person to, to show that you can work, have a family, get off of work, and commit yourself to politics. It was Dwight D. Eisenhower that said, it ought to be the part-time profession of all citizens to ensure that equality for all is, is right. And so, every day I would get off of work, and I'd come home, and I would work on the Humane Party. So, that is the paradigm that I'm hoping to change by running. The Humane Party is a party full of volunteers, and the officers of the Humane Party, or the candidates, or members of the board of directors, all sign an oath, similar to the Hippocratic Oath, the doctor sign. All of us sign an oath that we would live our lives according to humane values. That means in our clothes with polyester suits, or rayon, or non-leather, or non-animal uh, skin shoes, or belts, I mean, to the best of our abilities, we would embrace a vegan, plant-based, compassionate lifestyle. That's amazing. What other political party would do that. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? I, I'm so excited about that. I'm so excited to be representing a political party in our country, in our lifetime, that is committed to eliminating 
the systematic torture, abuse, annihilation, murder, rape, exploitation of all animals, including us. And I have not stopped. I am so dedicated to this party. There's a, there's a few more reasons why I'm, I'm dedicated to the main party. 200 years from now, we will be remembered as the party that was, like, like Abe Lincoln, Republican Party initially, remember? Remember their party was committed to eliminating human slavery, right? And, and Abe Lincoln went through a lot to get the uh, Emancipation Proclamation signed, right? Um, but we will be forever remembered in history, 200 years from now. Guess who told me this? My son. He said, Dad, I'm proud of what you're doing. Do you know 200 years from now, we're going to be in school, someone my age is going to read about you and the Humane Party, and they're going to remember you as the first political party that not only stood up for the rights of all human beings, but also for the rights of all non-human beings. And you, you, your party, Dad, is going to be the very first political party that puts your actions and your words and your values where your mouths are when you say that you're environmentalists. So the Humane Party, please, get, consider it. Go, go to humaneparty.org, look it up. Um, we have another candidate in, in Texas, his name is Robert Mason. And let me tell you, this guy, Okay, after uh, I ran for president, I started to hear about Robert that he wanted to run in Texas, no less. You know, you can imagine. <laughs> oh my goodness. He's running for House of Representatives, District 3. And he is serious. He is serious. I just saw a Facebook post of him. He changed his profile picture, he has his website up, and he's in a suit with no shoes and a yoga pose. <laughs> Awesome. I, 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 when I heard about him, I flew to Texas. And remember, all of us do things on our own dime for right now until we can build this party and get donations. And, you know, we ran basically on no donations for the 2016 campaign. I think I accepted two donations that I filed with the FEC. Um, but he's a, an amazing man. And now we have a 22-year-old young lady in Virginia that has expressed a very very uh, genuine interest in running for state senate. So keep your eye on her. Her name is um, Alexandra. So all of the volunteers for the Humane Party are uh, they're they're awesome. We have an economic transition team. Now let me tell you about the economic transition team. The economic transition team just gets together twice a week, maybe maybe once a week, but the the the, the leads of that team get together more than that. And they talk about some of the things that we are asked often. Like, oh, well, what are you going to do when you save all the animals? Where are you going to put them? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one time when I ran for president, I asked, uh, I, I interviewed with Alan Combs of Fox News Radio, rest in peace. Him and I became good friends after that. And he challenged me too. He said, well, if you take all the fish away, and, you, and, and you, what are you going to do? What are the fishermen going to do? What kind of jobs are they going to have? You know, so these are the things that we're committed to at the Humane Party with uh, the economic transition team. So let me go over quickly. I know I'm, I'm almost out of time. The five things that uh, distinguish the Humane Party. If you haven't already heard about the, this wonderful party. And remember, I've only been a volunteer since 2014. And uh, I recently did a video. I, I completed a video for the Senate coming up. And I call myself a fact. I still, I still hate the word politician, but I'm, I'm learning. I'm, I'm, I'm learning. Okay. Um, the, these are the things that completely make us unique. One is our platform. We truly have the most humane platform there is. It's not a, uh, you know, let's let's do this for animals on this time at this time, or let's make this, you know, the, uh, this one consideration, it's no, it's no, don't kill them, period, no. You're not, you're no animal should be killed, who are we to, to make that determination? Um, we think that the, the most ethical path for America is the most practical path for America, right? 
and that exploitation of non-human animals is at the heart of all the environmental issues, economic and health problems of our nation and of our planet. And I would imagine that all of you in this room would agree with that. Animal agriculture is destroying our planet. Reason number two. I mentioned earlier, candidates live their lives according to humane values. And we all sign an oath, and those oaths are actually filed away for public consumption. So if you ever come across someone that says, I am a humane party candidate, and you say, well, where's your oath? They should proudly be able to give that, give you a copy of it. I don't know any other party that does that. And specifically in the oath, it mentions the word vegan, it mentions the word humane in their personal choices, in their professional choices. So much so that I, I was very relieved when I came across this party because I'm, I was thinking to myself, gosh, I'm going to have to change jobs. I mean, I love Intel, right? And um, Intel has an excellent corporate social responsibility record. Corporate, uh, very good, uh, uh, you know, human rights record as well. Uh, reason number three. So I mentioned earlier that we don't just say we care about the environment, but the members of the Humane Party, right, Stacy? Yeah. We put our, our, our values and our actions where our mouths are. You know, where sometimes, you know, we, we have these, uh, I'll give you an example. El, the city of Elk Grove had the nerve to put a notice on our neighborhood that told us how long of a shower we should take and when we can water our grass. And I saw that, and you literally can go down the street, down I-5, and see water on all day watering these cows. I mean, it's just crazy. Uh, you know, we serve as a new benchmark for all other political parties, and even the United Nations. You guys have seen that report. Okay? Our health care plan is going to be the best in the nation. We've already set the foundation for a health care plan that is going to be based in truth. And I love this one. A solution that allows for our nation's natural resources, including our land, air, and water resources, to serve as a source for economic strength and national security. Our economic transition team has already made some outstanding proposals. So only if there were more human party candidates. Remember, the Constitution says that if you're a certain age, you can run for Senate, you can run for the House of Representatives, you can run for the President. I remember when I called Breeze Harper. Breeze Harper is a PhD. She's a vegan, and I used to just see her Facebook post, and I thought she was outstanding. She's, uh, she's dedicated to intersectionalism in, in, in how we eat. Uh, been a vegan. She's married to a physicist from Europe. And uh, I just called her out the blue. And I said, hey, 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 please, would you like to be my running mate for U.S. president? I read some of the same articles we did for Veg News. So she wrote back. She said, do you have the right breeze? <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah. Um, please consider running U.S. Please. Please consider running for office. Whether it's local, state, or federal. Uh, I've always said we need to replace our current governmental representatives with women and men of ethics and science. And we'll help you. <laughs> yes, and we will help you. And these are the numbers. Remember, to approve the abolition amendment, these are the numbers that we need. So we just need to, to fill a majority in the House of Representatives and fill a majority in Congress and get a U.S. president that's vegan. <laughs> and, and, I'm, and, and only if we leverage all of our collective and compassionate intelligence to finally remember, we're already figuring this out, and the politicians have not. Now, logically to me, I'm a logic guy. If we figured it out and they have not, we're smart. <laughs> okay? Um, I'm going to end it with, with one quick story. 
In high school, I wanted to go to the University of California, Berkeley. I just moved from Japan. My father said, come live here. If you live here for a year, college will be cheaper. I checked out the school at UC Berkeley. I said, Dad, no, I heard of UCLA. No, don't go to that. I want you to go to UC Berkeley. Went to, I came here, went to high school, abandoned high school in Fairfield. Twelfth grade, I had a 3.8 GPA. Okay? I scored maybe uh, 1,400 on my SAT at the time. And I told my counselor I wanted to go to Berkeley. He's told me, well, let me get you on this tour for Solano College. I think it'd be a better option for you. Um, you just, I don't know, Clifton. I don't think you'll get, I don't think you'll get um, admitted. And that next semester, I was going to Berkeley. Three of the people. Um, I'm, I'm sharing this with you because I'm a person, I don't care if I lost to Trump last year. I don't care that I would, if I lose to Diane Feinstein this year, I have it in me now to represent you and represent the animals, and I hope to earn your vote. Thank you. We'll have to get the new speaker in here, but if you want to spend a few time answering questions or talking Absolutely. to people, we have a table outside. Thank you.